Hello, my name is Arnaud Delorme, and uh, this is part four, removing ICA competence artifact in EEG from uh, the series on independent competent analysis applied to EEG time series. So here I'm going to explain you how do you remove artifact components from EEG data. So on the left here you have EEG data, then you apply the unmixing matrix, you apply the uh, ICA, and then you get uh, the composition, which is time course of components, time the scalp topography of the components. And the original data is equal to the sum of these activation times with scalp topographies. So the first one here, the top one, for instance, is a blink. We can see the blink very clearly. The dotted lines in, uh, indicate stimuli. You can see in the second one, the second one uh, shows a P300 components. So some real brain uh, activity, the fourth one, uh, likely represents oscillation, alpha oscillation in the occipital areas. And the last one, the fourth one, IC4, represent muscle activity, so very high frequency, but we might want to remove. So in this case, we would want to remove both component number one and component number four. And we do that here by simply zeroing out their activity and then applying the inverse transformation to get back the data without these artifacts. So if you remember the previous video in which I showed this formalism, in which you take the IC activity, you multiply by the inverse weight matrix, which column represents the like, scalp topographies, and then you get back the original data. What you can simply do if you want to remove these components is zero out the activity of the components. So when you multiply the IC activity by the scalp topography, you get back the, uh, the data without these components. You could also zero out the columns if you wanted to be uh, equivalent. Now let's see some example, some example of IC applied to real data. So here we have some original EEG data and we're going to apply IC and try to remove this uh, artifact in here, so in red is the uh, artifact corrected EEG data, and here you can see that the bump in the middle, which represented some uh, eye artifact, is gone, but the oscillations are not gone, so it selectively removes uh, this specific artifact. Here is another example, so on the left you have the raw data, this is from 15 subjects here, and then on the right you have after artifact removal. What's very interesting with this data is that actually uh, these were channels here near the eyes. These were actually eye channels. So we we're able to process actually cognitive information, uh, cognitive activity on these uh, eye channels after applying ICA. Here, this is another example to show that in some cases, the electrodes which are uh, affected by the uh, relative to the components here we have two components and one is i artifact one is actually a cognitive artifact so uh, you have the scalp topography of the components and below that you have what we call the earth image we have another lecture on, on what is the earth image but to make it short it's the stacked trials so one trial on top of the other this way we can see all the trials and here they're specifically sorted by the reaction time of the subject. And then we can see on the left, we have a nice component which activity is related to reaction time because the red here is overlapping with the uh, reaction time uh, onset, the dotted line. And on the right, we have a typical blink component. So we can see actually the individual blinks in the data. And what's very interesting is that these two components the, the ICA decomposition, they have very strong weights on the, both the frontal channel. And these components, so these components have weights on the, on the frontal channel and they highly overlap. Yes, they're, uh, yet they're artifacts. The, the artifacts are clearly isolated from the time activity. So you can have overlapping uh, scalp topography. Here for reference, this is the ERP, so this is just the average trials for uh, these two components, and we can see, the, again, the ERP is very different for these two types of components. Here's another example of uh, IC applied to EEG time series. So here, this was a 256 channel montage, 
and uh, the subject was moving their head a little bit during the experiment. And when we applied ICA, we had all these components here in the in the back uh, in the back of the head. So we wonder what these were. And these actually these components correspond to the insertion points of the muscle on the back of the head. So ICA was able to isolate uh, individual uh, muscle groups in this case. And these components have very high frequency activity. So activity in high frequency, which are typical of uh, muscle components. So this was a nice illustration of, again, using ICA to uh, isolate muscle activity. Here's another uh, example. This is a simulation example in which we took real data and we added artifacts. So we added different types of artifacts. We added uh, transient high frequency, so this is like muscle activity, and we added them with a special topography. We added low frequency events, which is like eye blinks, and again we use a sp specific topography that's typical of EEG. We added signal discontinuity, which are relatively frequent, depending on the amplifier you use, the EG amplifier. We added high frequency noise. We added some linear drift, again, which are observed in real EEG data. And then we added some real EEG data, some very clean EEG data. And this is an example. Uh, for, uh, so here we have all the different types of noise over, overlaid on the real EEG data. Uh, the low frequency events, we can see here and see on color. We have the linear trends. We have the transient high frequency events. We have the high noise trials and we have the discontinuity. And again, here we selectively, we only alter some of the trials. And then we try to have uh, ICA, we cover which trials uh, were contaminated or try it directly on the raw data. And that's what we presented here. So the shaded area show the performance on the raw data without using ICA. Can we detect these uh, bad trials? And for these, we use different methods, uh, usually, for instance, example, the kurtosis, the skewness of, uh, of the distribution in the data. And we did the same with the, after applying uh, ICA. Can we find out which trials were contaminated? And what we can see on this curve is, especially when we have high noise, uh, then it becomes uh, ICA becomes very much more powerful than using it on the on the actual data. So when you have very noisy data, uh, the basically these techniques of finding the bad trials break down. But uh, if you use ICA, they don't break down as fast. So ICA is more efficient at find at, uh, at extracting this artifact from this data. And we try with different uh, ICA algorithms. Here we are three of them: Sobe, uh, Fast ICA. And we basically found uh, similar uh, behavior for all these IC algorithms. So this is using ICA to either remove the scalp topography of some ICA components or to find artifactual trials. There's alternate solutions. So here, for example, we are looking at gamma power, so above 25 hertz, in meditators versus control. And we found a nice result in which uh, all the meditators the meditators on average show higher gamma power than uh, controls. The issue with gamma power is that it can very well be muscle. It's very hard to assess that it's not muscle. Even when you use ICA to remove uh, muscle components, there could be some muscle remaining. How do we know it's not muscle? How do we know that the meditators just don't contract the muscle and that's why they have uh, higher gamma power? To do, to do that, what we did is that we applied the same analysis to the artifactual ICA components. And that's what's shown here. So we have the blinks, we also did it on the temporal muscle. What we found is that we had no difference whatsoever between meditators and control when we apply the analysis, the gamma analysis, to the artifacts. So if it was muscle, most likely, when we apply the analysis to the muscle components, we would find the same difference. That's not what we found here. So, uh, so it gives us some confidence that the original difference we saw uh, was likely due to actual brain activity and not to muscle activity. 
Here's another example. We did it again here for four different meditation tradition. We found a nice difference between the free meditation tradition here on the left and the control. So the control is the blue curve. When we apply the same analysis to the temporal muscle components, we found no such difference whatsoever, which is a clear indication that gamma activity in this case was likely not due uh, to muscles. So I want to thank you for your attention and I'll see you in the next uh, video.